My name is Dimitri Krasakis. I'm, I think I've met a lot of you by now. I'm a pediatrician and epidemiologist at the University of Washington, and I've been I've had the honor of being on the Board of Advisors for Children's Screen since it started, and for the last eight months um, served as their chief science officer. So uh, that's one of the hats I'm wearing here today. Um, so this is going to be a completely no-tech session. It's going to be, there's no PowerPoints. It's going to be uh, people talking. We have some of the leaders in the world on young children media here. So you're, you're very lucky that you'll get to hear their insights. And I promise you we'll have time for your questions. So start thinking about what you want to ask. So we're going to be low tech, and I'm going to ask that you guys be low tech. So let's see if no one can get on their phone. And I'll ask you at the end how many of you were able to stay off your phone for the full hour. I'll blind myself so I won't see who's, uh, who wasn't able to do it. Um, the Baroness set the opening uh, session. I don't know how many of you guys were here to hear a terrific talk. And she said that uh, one of the areas that she feels more research is desperately needed is in young children. And um, I happen to agree with that. I think everyone on this, on this uh, panel agrees with it. I got interested in young children in media 25 years ago, or 26. I, I know precisely when. It's because when my son was born and I was at home with him um, as a young parent going crazy, uh, and watching more daytime television myself than I'd ever watched and noticing that he was interested in the television that I was watching and, and that was what got me interested in it um, and I've been working on it ever since. The, the, the people on this panel have, 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 will introduce themselves in a second and all of them have been working in this area about as long as I have. These, um, it was a very, very niche, small area. It still kind of is, but it's, it's clearly grown, I think especially thanks to a lot of the mentorship that you've been doing to get more people into this field. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Um, I'm just gonna sort of ask the, um, the panelists questions that I have, and we'll see how it goes. They can talk amongst themselves. I will prompt a discussion if necessary. But I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves very briefly and tell me what your recommendation is for the youngest age that children should start watching and how many hours a day you think they should watch. And what we're, this is gonna focus on zero to five. <laughs> and I will start with you, John, and we'll just go down. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, so when we were told that there was like an unstructured approach to this early on, I was pretty convinced that, that we come out here and play with blocks or have crayons or something. I, and I'm really kind of thrown off by the idea that we don't have you know, any media and we also don't have any toys. So um, I guess I'm, I'm just going to have to go with my, my limited verbal skills. Um, I'm an associate professor of uh, pediatrics at Cincinnati Children's. I'm a general pediatrician by training. I'm a father of three girls um, who take good care of me. And I also am a children's book author. But um, as far as oh, and my, my research interest at, at Children's is, is reading and literacy primarily, I got into screen time or digital media um, really when I was running a children's bookstore for a number of years, which is right about when the Baby Einstein phenomenon came out, and I noticed this big, I got very concerned about these sort of loggerheads between books and books that were through videos, and that's actually when I read some of Dimitri's work early on and got pretty interested in, this, in the space. Um, a lot of our research has involved MRI um, to a limited degree and then some screening tools. Okay. But other than that, my recommendation for screen time. So I, I have a catchphrase that I've used, screen free until three. Ooh. Um, and that's sort of the, um, you know, with the idea that, you know, before kids get to school, they really don't know what they're missing um, as much, although that's kind of, um, kind of got a big asterisk next to it when parents are on their phones and their kids are watching them. Used to be that they didn't know what they're missing as much, but um, I think if you can get them to school, you probably won't, won't regret it as a parent, and they certainly can catch up in their digital skills once they actually get into the into the real world. So, anyway, that's it. Thanks, John. Karen, you want to introduce yourself and answer my question? Sure. Boy, that's I, I, go ahead. I'm guessing we're going to get different Th thank answers. Thank you, Dimitri, and thank you for having me on the panel. I also want to thank my fellow panelists because. Through your work, you have really inspired me and helped me to form a, a framework for a lot of the work that I have done. So I'm at Drexel University. I'm in the Department of Psychiatry, uh, associate professor. Uh, I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, I am a physician. And um, my uh, 
area of interest is in early modifiable risk factors and subsequent child development, particularly uh, screen time, reading, uh, time outside, uh, parent-child interactions, those early modifiable risk factors, because parent-child interactions are so important and how screens in interfere with them. Um, and then outcomes including sensory outcomes uh, and uh, we're also looking at autism-like symptoms as an outcome. So we've done a review We've looked at uh, national children's study data um, to look at cohort studies, and also we've been involved in some intervention studies. As far as screen time, as far as screen time recommendations, I would say no screen time until age two and only one hour through age five. So pretty much with the American Academy yeah. of Pediatric Recommendations, except I take a little harder line between that 18 months and the two years. <sighs> Okay, Heather. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Heather Krikorian from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I've been working in this space since 2002 um, when I started a graduate program with Dan Anderson at UMass Amherst and I've never looked back, I've been doing this ever since. Um, and uh, gosh, I'm, I'm going to give two answers that are going to feel really dodgy, so I'm just going to own that right now. Um, so, uh, so there was how much time, what was the other question? What age? Oh, but you can tell us, about, tell, us, tell us a little bit more what, you're do, what you do, and oh, then I'm going to sure. ask you more about that, but go what ahead. What do I do? Um, so my research generally falls into two arms. One is kind of understanding the ecology of media use, so how parent-child interactions around media use affect development, um, how media might displace or enhance parent-child interactions, so that's sort of one side of it. And the other side is around um, cognitive development in infancy and early childhood and how that may or may not relate to um, screen time, usually in kind of in-the-moment real-time measures, like how children play and interact with people um, during media use or when there's a TV on in the background, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, uh, whether and how they learn from screen media during those earliest years. Um, uh, and so earliest age um, of, uh, I think you said watching, so I'm, I'm going to say it depends on what they're doing. Okay. So if you mean video viewing. So I'm, I'm not terribly concerned about minimum age for something like video chat. So if it's something that's socially interactive um, and engaging um, with real people in real time, then I, I tend not to think of it as screen time. And in terms of how much time, I've always been really averse to the idea of setting minute-based limits because so much of it depends on what they're doing. So if we're going to go time, what I tend to do when I'm talking to parent groups and teacher groups and others is focus on what other things I care about in kids' day. Are they getting the right amount of sleep? Are they getting enough green time? Are they getting enough um, focused on distracted social interactions and solitary play? And they sort of fill in the pie of the 24 hours that way. So those are the hours I care about. And then with the leftover time, I'm a lot less fussy about what they do with that. And you didn't give me an age, though. Did you? Did I miss it? Uh, I guess the age would be, I'd, I'm not terribly concerned. About, like, not sort concerned. Of if it's video chat. But no, no, you said that. that but OK, yeah. understood. But regular wa watching. Oh, TV viewing? Or, or program viewing, let's say, because it's often not on a TV. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I'm not sure I have an opinion on that. Okay, you don't have to. Yeah. No opinion I, is no hard, opinion is an I'd opinion. Have a hard time. Yeah. All right, Dr. Barr, Professor Barr. Right. I'm Rachel Barr. I'm a professor at Georgetown University in the Department of Psychology, um, and I'm a direct. I am the director of the Georgetown Early Learning Project, and I first became interested in this in the mid '90s. Uh, so I'm a memory researcher by training. And uh, learning from screens is actually just a really interesting memory problem. How do you solve what is in, on that screen uh, and then match it to what is going on in the real world? So that's where my interest started. And um, since then, I've become very interested in the, both the content and the context of early media exposure. And I think the context is probably the most important uh, piece when we're thinking about how and why and when and where media is being used, um, rather than how much is being used. So in answer to your question, uh, Dimitri, I think um, that, and actually one more piece about my research, I think that uh, infants are incredible, and I've always thought that they're incredible, because they can pick up information from multiple different sources. 
And so they can learn and adapt to lots of different uh, pieces of information. If we could learn as much as them, it would be incredible. So the first study where I started thinking about television was an imitation study, and that's when, um, this is in the 90s, uh, and I was in the Southern Hemisphere, and the Wiggles. Has anyone heard of the Wiggles? Yeah. Okay. So children were dancing to the Wiggles, and so that was my first introduction, and then thinking about how they're learning and remembering. So in answer to your question, um, and, and thinking about what my question is, how do children learn and pick up information, I would say all screens are not created equal. And that case, uh, the same as what uh, Heather was saying, video chat with remote families during um, a time of separation because you're incarcerated or you're deployed or you're a grandparent during the uh, pandemic, that I think is uh, very beneficial to the parents and building the relationship from the parents and the grandparents' side, which then supports the child. Um, in terms of television, that may also support the relationship, as we heard yesterday from Heather, in terms of giving the parent a break. Uh, so we, we are often considering um, what is this time limit or what is... Um, yeah, what is this time limit? But I would rather think about what is the purpose and uh, the need of the family uh, and how, how can that possibly be met in a way that will continue to build relationships. So I'm also not going to give an actual time or, or age, age. Wow. Uh, because I think we need to think about it in a bit more of a contextual framework. Great. Um, just quickly. <laughs> There's some people that are very happy with what you've said. Um, Karen and John, do you have an objection to video chatting? I mean, when you said no screens, no, both of you did. I mean, many people make the video chat exception. I certainly do. So I, I go ahead. So I consider video chatting very differently from other screen time because it's responsive. Yep. So the studies with video chatting show that children can learn because the, the person on the other side is actually responding to them, interacting in real time. So it's, I consider it just a different animal. Okay, John, you agree? Yeah, I would agree with that too. I, I think a lot of it, you know, to, to the point earlier, it really does come down to what, what's the intended purpose of the screen, like, and, and if, the, if it's to talk to grandma, that's a pretty benign purpose, but if it's to calm the child when they're fussy or to teach them language, then that's a whole nother. What about to calm the parents? That's what, that's what yeah. Rachel and, and Heather were contending. What about calming the parents down? Oof. Uh, I mean, that, yeah. I mean, I, I think overall, you know, humanity's tolerance for boredom and, and fussiness has really gone through the, through the basement. So, so we're, I think, you know, parents' um, self-regulation skills probably are, have, have, have suffered because of their screens as have mine, you know, just as children have. So. Yeah. So you're you're so both you, Karen and John, don't allow you're you're if 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 the parent, mom or dad or whatever, um, needs a break, as Rachel and Heather said. Do you make exceptions for that, or you say like? I think that children through. can play with traditional toys and keep themselves somewhat entertained. Um, depending on the age, and that that time provides a lot of opportunity for exploration and uh, self learning to sort of self soothe. So um, I'm kind of opposed to uh, parents giving their phone to their child when their child is maybe having a difficult time because I feel it is. A, a brain learning mechanism to sort of deal with those moments. And parents can be really um, creative about providing interesting things for little kids to play with that they can touch, that they can, you know, look at different colors. And I'm, I'm a grandparent of a nine month old and we've been effective so far. <laughs> Heather, you're nodding. I, I, I'm curious about the self-regulation piece. I know you've done some work in that area. You want to talk about the, the challenges of self-regulation, self of relying on screens for young children? And yeah. Rachel, too, if you have anything to say on that, both of you. 
Yeah, definitely. I, I totally agree. And I think um, one of the things I've gotten really interested in in um, recent work, some of which is with Rachel, is asking parents about reasons because I think there's um, some compelling evidence in the last few years from a few people who are here at this conference around the reasons parents are using screens with and around their children and how that might result in different outcomes. And I think the strongest evidence for potential harms at this point is around that kind of regulatory screen use. So. Um, so when I say parents getting a break, I don't mean my kid's freaking out and I don't want to figure out how to fix it, so I'm going to give them a screen. That is likely to be more problematic than I'm overwhelmed as a parent, job stress, whatever kind of financial stress, whatever it might be, and I need a break, but I don't want to distance myself from my child. And the data we um, had in our poster yesterday are kind of consistent with this idea that, um, you know, sort of curling up together and watching a beloved uh, video or something like that together can might lead to positive parent-child interactions or be associated with positive parent-child interactions. Um, and that's the kind of thing I'm talking about when I say sort of take a break. I don't mean the kids crazy and I need them to not be crazy here, I'll reward you with this iPad for freaking out. Um, that, I think that's really different from, I want closeness, I want warmth with my kid and I can't be there for them right now for whatever complex reasons I have as a parent. But you, you specifically said co-viewing in that situation, is that what you mean? So you mean co-viewing? Uh, yeah, I think that's one, one way to do it. So we definitely would ask about that and distinguish that from, I need you occupied so I can do a thing which is a, a kind of a third bucket, actually, right? Okay. I need you occupied so I can do a thing. Um, and that, uh, in the data we were presenting yesterday, is associated with both positive and negative parent-child interaction. So kind of both, sort of both of those things. You know, I'm old enough to remember when they were play pens for that situation, you know? <laughs> they fell out of favor. I don't think they exist anymore. It was, yeah. you know, it was like you were jailing your child, but it was a way that a parent could put a child in a jail with some <laughs> toys and leave the room and come back and know that they couldn't get into too much trouble. I don't, I'm not sure why those have disappeared. Rachel, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, I, I just have, um, I have a couple of things. So I, I think there's also, uh, so I agree entirely with uh, what Heather had said and there has been you know, a lot of really good um, work in terms of bi-directional effects as well. So, uh, and we j and just next door there was just a presentation um, for uh, on reducing um, externalizing behaviours and then sort of be building in a parenting intervention around uh, supporting parents around their media use there. So I think um, for some children they may find it more difficult to transition away. We've heard a lot about problematic media use and for those children um, then other, um, there can be lots of different strategies in place as well. So it may not be for every child as well that screen time will be equal. So this is what I mean, all, all screen time is not created equal and is not all created equal for every child. The second thing is that I think very short bursts of media have never, uh, have not really been associated with long-term negative impacts. Um, so sh very short bursts um, are, are more likely to be protective in the way that uh, Heather was, was talking about. And then finally, we often, I really want to go back again to this bigger discussion and think about sort of the family media ecology. So when we say what should be the screen time at what age for a baby, then we're not considering the whole environment of the baby. So parents have got their own screens, they're looking at their screens, you know, you get 100 notifications a day, so that, um, and that is probably more likely from Heather Kikorian and Dan Addison's work, these disrupt, and, and uh, Brandon McDaniel's work, these brief interruptions and disruptions uh, in interactions are probably more problematic than, say, 10 minutes of Sesame Street or something. So I, I, that's what I mean. We really need to think about what a, and I think Jenny Radeski put this really nicely uh, yesterday, is we need to sort of think more about what are these moment-to-moment -moment points where we could do intervention. So I'm going to turn off my phone and play for 15 minutes um, uninterrupted, and that could be really positive, and this is actually one, I'm stealing this from um, uh, Dr. Griffith, um, and that special time with the child, and it's uninterrupted by any media device. Uh, and then there may be, like, later in the day, um, there can be lots of creative solutions, and parents can also be exhausted and overwhelmed and may need um, also screen as another 
possible option. Not always is the option, but as a possible option. Thanks. I'm going to just make one comment, and then we'll circle around again with other things. But you know, the interesting thing about this, when we're talking about infant viewing now, I asked you guys about ages, and you gave different ages. Some of you dodged the question entirely. But <laughs> but but um, there were no programs, as you know, um, before Baby Einstein, as John talked about. So really, this phenomenon of putting infants in front of TVs is a is a new one. Can I go first on this one? What's that? Can I go first on this? One? Can you what? Can I go first on this one? Huh? Uh, on this question, when you get to it, but. <laughs> I, I'm the moderator. Yeah. <laughs> so, did you have something you want to say about that? I did. Okay. So, so the thing well, is... I, mean, I didn't call on you, Rachel. No, I, <laughs> this is a self-regulation yeah. problem. <laughs> I do, I do. It must be my screen time. Okay, um, go ahead. So, no, my, my thing here is that there were not infant-directed programs, but infants were always uh, in rooms where there were screens uh, and possibly for hours a day. I think this is really a measurement problem. Um, so there were not infant-directed programs until the 90s. But many children at, um, under two were watching Sesame Street and looking at, and from, you know, from the children's workshop data, they were watching and seeing those screens and those children's programs under two. If you have an older sibling who's four and the baby's in the room, they're in the room seeing Sesame Street as well. So I think when we say, this is a new phenomenon. I really don't think this is a new phenomenon. I think when we asked, are you, um, how many hours a day do you let your child watch television? That was a sort of intentional watching, but we missed a whole uh, range of exposures that children have had since screens have sort of been in the home and babies have been in the home with them. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna ask the next question is, uh, I want you to tell me the coolest thing you're working on right now and you each get two minutes. So we'll start with maybe three. Karen, go ahead. What's the coolest thing you're working on? Well, the most exciting thing... Well, that's what I mean. Okay. We're Sorry. Working on I was trying to be is, cool. Um, well, I want to give you a little bit of a background. So we uh, reviewed natu the National Children's Study data, and we found an association between early screen time and autism-like symptoms, not a causation, but an association. Um, and I also reviewed the literature, and I found a, a lot of, I, I, in terms of autism, because I have, a, I have a personal interest in autism. I have a son uh, who is autistic, and so when I came to this, and my background's in ophthalmology, I um, felt it was important to review the literature and on autism, on brain changes, on early childhood development, on parent-child interactions, on a lot of things that my co-presenters um, are working on, have worked on. And uh, I, I became acquainted with Lori Frome, who's also here today, and she told me about some experiences she had been having with children who had had high screen exposure and autism, like symptoms. Some of them had an autism diagnosis. And then um, I was very fortunate to visit with some of those children and uh, see uh, really rapid improvements when she explained to the parents about removing the screens and, and doing social interaction. So we took that information and manualized it at Drexel and did a small pilot study. And the exciting thing to me was that it was life-changing for these kids and the families. So these are kids, on average, that they had high screen exposure, uh, five hours a day on average. After we did a, a training for the parents, their screen exposure for the kids on a, on a daily basis went down to five minutes a day throughout the, the six-month study. Um, the children were young. They were 18 months to 40 months. Um, we measured, the, uh, we had a lot of testing done through the AJ Drexel Autism Institute, and over the six-month study, their autism symptoms decreased, and the parents' stress went down. Um, and um, the parents were very excited to keep the screens off because they saw changes in their children within the first two to four weeks. So the eye contact was getting better. And in some of these children, they really had no interest in being with the, with the parents. Initially, they were very interested in doing their own things or playing by themselves. And that was a huge change because now the children 
wanted to be with the parents. So that is exciting. So we're going to be doing, we, we got funding for a randomized controlled trial. That's personally what I'm very excited about. Great. So, Good. John, what are you most excited about? Um, well, the blocks was going to be exciting, but um, <laughs> no, I... I uh, so I'll get couple, you some later. We'll play them. A couple of things. One of the things, you know, the um, one area that I've worked in, the MRI, kind of um, hasn't been a ton going on since COVID because it was just so hard to recruit over this couple of years. But we're just kind of getting some um, some protocols together, looking at uh, early literacy, which we've looked at before, numeracy skills, and social cognition in preschool kids using MRIs as a measure between three years old and kindergarten. Um, as a longitudinal um, study, that's one. And then, and then one study that we put together during COVID um, has been more of a clinical. Um, it's a program called Read, Rest, Recover. That's uh, it's a for uh, inpatients in, in the hospital and pediatrics. One of the things you'll notice when kids are admitted to the hospital, before they start the IV, they usually turn the TV on in the bedroom. And it's this real captive population of, of families who come in, their kid's sick, they don't know what to do, you know, how do they interact with them, and very often the TV's on all the time. And um, very much, in, you know, contrary to AAP recommendations, this can be babies, this can be, um, you know, adolescents. And so we've got this um, pilot where we're encouraging um, staff on the units and parents to turn off TVs when the child's, is, our, our TVs and their own screens and tablets and everything else when the kids are sleeping and overnight just to see if we can make an impact on um, quality, of, quality of the hospital stay and um, attitudes towards screens when families leave. We've got some survey data showing that parents really do um, take that to heart and, and listen when we actually are trying to model um, the recommendations. A lot of them don't really know what the recommendations even are and we give them some, some handouts some information about how to help limit um, the child's screen time both in the hospital and at home because there really aren't any guidelines currently about what is a healthy amount of screen time when kids are sick. You know, all the guidelines we have is when they're, when they're well. And it could be the case that when kids are sick that it's, it's fine to just turn on the TV and let them veg out for three days, but also maybe they're missing out on an opportunity to interact with their caregivers and maybe that could help them get better faster. So that's just uh, one area that, that I'm kind of excited about. So anyway. Great, thanks. Uh, Heather, what are you excited about? Um, yeah, gosh, I feel like a broken record, but honestly, the thing I'm most excited about right now is um, if you were in the parenting panel yesterday, the project I alluded to there, um, but I'll, I'll sort of give it a different spin so it doesn't feel totally redundant. Um, the, uh, what I'm most excited about with this work is it sort of taking, it, so just for context, if you, uh, if you don't know me before now, um, I'm sort of trained, I'm an experimental psychologist by training, and I'm trained in very much that traditional cognitive psych tradition of bringing folks into a lab, controlling everything you can, finding the mechanism, and being very precise on everything. And I sort of had this pause, as many of us did in 2020, where I can't meet kids in preschools and in my lab, and that sort of thing, kind of reflecting on what is this really helping anyone or is it just a fun puzzle for me to solve and so this project this kind of ecology of media use project is sort of getting into the wild is sort of seeing what's happening in the wild and trying to capture that in real time which is like an external real world version of what i've been trying to do in uh, living room labs in my lab for um for quite a while now so i'm really excited about that kind of in the wild aspect of this work great rachel yeah i mean it I'm, I'm very interested, so I mentioned this CAFE consortium and I'm lucky enough that I get to be involved in lots of uh, different projects and collaborating uh, with lots of people and I think that's the piece that I'm most excited about is, is working together uh, on this sort of common problem of how are we capturing this family media ecology, but then how is it tied to different aspects? So we have, uh, there's a group in Germany who's looking at sleep. There's a group in Sweden who's looking at language, a group in uh, Israel looking at executive functioning, a group, a Heather's group who's looking, um, and also Jenny Radeski who's looking at executive functioning. So trying to sort of have all of these groups come together um, having a shared metric and the piece that I'm excited about but also uh, is definitely challenging, we don't often talk about how it's sort of challenging to do some of this research, uh, is comparing across different countries. So um, we are currently combining data from 
uh, five countries that collected data during lockdown to see if policies in different countries. So we've talked about you know multiple different levels and those country level, policy level uh, differences and how they affect uh, and did affect children during the pandemic. So that's I'm excited about the team and I'm excited you know Great. like the team science aspect and I'm excited about really combining and looking across multiple countries. So you know what I've been working on now in my lab has been looking at compulsive media use or screen use in very young children, 18 to 24 months, specifically around iPad use. And we bring them into the lab and we do a series of tests, including um, reciprocal response and, and, um, and willingness to return a toy versus an, an iPad app. And actually we're seeing that there are a sizable percentage of young children who show problem, what we're calling problematic. I mean, there is no formal definition of addiction or even problematic usage, although we're, that's, that's what we're endeavoring and trying to show. And I'm just curious, because the two, the two of you at the end of this panel seem to be fairly laissez-faire, not per se alarmed about young children on screens. And I, I think the truth is that a lot of the literature on television um, for young children, uh, these young children, very young children, doesn't, in my opinion, apply to the use of iPads. I think the interactivity, the contingent response that children get um, feeds into their innate desire to try to understand causality, and it also feeds into their, the problem they encounter when causality is, is, is you know, the, the wow. violation of expectation paradigm. So if you give an infant an iPad, and you've probably seen this, they, they'll instantly take to it and start to hit it. And, deliberately or purely by accident, by the structure of the device, it will give uh, predictable and unpredictable responses. And I think that is one of the challenges, that kids will spend a lot, little kids, some in particular, sort of, we're always talking about differential susceptibilities. There are those kids that'll be very uh, compulsive users. And then, it, the mechanism may be unclear, but it may be that it's just the missed opportunities for other things that this starts to crowd out that becomes a problem. And then, of course, Karen is of the opinion that these early screens can be causally related to autism. Um, that research obviously has not been convincingly done yet, or, but you, you're, you still maintain that, that, that screens are really not something to be too concerned about. Um. So I, I wouldn't say laissez-faire. I, can I re... Uh, well, you didn't give a... You, no, I don't give... Okay. If so I were I a parent listening to you, I would, have a, I would feel like pretty good about whatever screen use I was doing. Okay, so then let me rephrase. <laughs> um, so I think that still, even in 2023, we don't know a lot about early childhood. We don't know a lot about the long-term effects because we haven't really conducted systematic longitudinal uh, studies. Uh, on the effects of exposure and because media has changed a lot. I do think there are potential harms and I do think there are potential gains. Yeah. I don't think there are only potential harms. Right. And just you know, going back to what the Baroness said, we could build a better digital world, we could design and support families um, with technology to uh, give different opportunities to them. So I... I I object to the term laissez-faire. I think that I think that we really, I, I really want to understand how and why. And I think the mechanisms are really important. So, um, who is at risk? Who is more likely longitudinally to experience problematic uh, uses? Is it something, um, you know, some susceptibilities to emotion dysregulation and um, are they exacerbated across a different uh, timeline? Uh, is it like a cumulative effect of amount across time? Or is it the type of interaction? So, but I think we really don't actually, we, we, why, I'm, why I'm not saying a specific amount of time and everything yet is one, most children are exposed by four months of age. So, um, so this is this is the world, uh, and I'm not really, you know, thinking about the limit on that because this is not my responsibility as a as a psychologist. Uh, and I'm so grateful for, uh, you know, the American Pediatric Association and other other organisations who are doing this. 
But um, I think we really need to get a bigger picture and we do need to consider these other constraints that are on families and not just sort of ignore the constraints on the families as well. Okay. Go ahead, John. I, I, I just want to, I mean, that's a, that's a great point. I, I, I want to kind of go back to my three, you know, screen free and tall three thing. Um, I think one, one of the anchors that I have for that, in addition to kids don't know what they're missing, which seems a little flip, is think about like the sensitive periods of brain development, like the different neural circuits and the, the networks in the brain, um, plasticity peaks at different ages. And most of the, the networks for um, those early skills peak around the age, you know, from zero to three. I mean, they sort of have very high peaks. And then the, and then the, uh, the tails for the higher order skills, like your um, math skills and your, and your reading skills and everything, those, those tail off through you know, adolescence, early adulthood, but the, but the real basic early skills, including sort of social cognition, um, you know, vision, other things, you know, peak very early. So if you think about what these different circuits need at these different ages, you know, the brain is essentially an analog organ that, that's evolved over millennia to process senses, you know, the five senses and social cues and other things. So these circuits are just waiting there, I need language, you know, I'm two, and is it gonna get the right language from a device or is it gonna get it from a person? And if it gets it, is it gonna be coming at them or are they gonna have a chance to talk? You know, and the same with, with vision. We know that the, based on ABC data and some of, some of our work, that cortical thinning seems to happen more, more rapidly in kids that have a lot of screen time, probably because those circuits are developing more quickly. They probably are, are maturing fast because of exposure to screens. But in any case, um, we just have to, have to really think, what are screens good at stimulating, what are they not? And the other elephant in the room is like the dopamine circuits. You know, the kids that are getting, to Dimitri's point, with iPads, they're getting just a quick fix of just a bunch of stuff happening, and they're just getting those circuits being reinforced where they're gonna be more predisposed to become more addicted to screens and everything. So whatever it is that's stimulating these networks in those early years is gonna reinforce the circuits that then the child's gonna carry with them through their life. Um, and I just think we should need to be careful. Um, because, you know, we don't really know what a lot of these long-term effects are, and until we really know it's safe, I think we should just be, be cautious. Yeah, I, you know, I was struck... <laughs> I, I was struck um, as I was before, you know, the, before there was the HBCD study, there was this attempt at a national longitudinal study, I don't know, I was involved in some of the planning for that, and I argued at the time, unsuccessfully, that they would be missing a great opportunity if they didn't embed some experimental studies within this large cohort of people. Now we're launching the HBCD, and I fear they're doing the same thing, because for those of us that are struggling for an answer about this question about early media exposure, it's not going to get us past the possibility that there's residual confounding, that the babies that start watching earlier were somehow predisposed to any of the problems that later are predicted by it. And the idea that they wouldn't consider, and I did mention it, um, attempting to at least in some fraction of those children experimentally manipulate either content or context or quantity or age of initiation um, to see and answer once and for all uh, some of the questions that we've had here, I think is a huge missed opportunity. Yeah. Uh, can, can I, I comment? Yeah, ahead, of course. Okay. And then Heather, yeah, go ahead. So um, I wanted to just remark a little bit about what John was saying. So early on, children uh, are, are attracted to screens because the color, the motion, the um, audiovisual stimulation, and that's even before they develop the um, affinity to looking at faces. So I, I think it is really important to consider this as a unique time in uh, child development where they're very, they may be very sensitive. But I also, in talking about the ages of screen time, and I, I wanna just bring up a, a, a concern of mine because there are at-risk populations uh, in terms of uh, parent, uh, mothers with uh, postpartum depression, um, uh, families that are economically disadvantaged and, and other considerations and they don't have resources and it's really hard for them and I think as a community, as a, a society, we have to do better to support them so that they have options for good daycare because a lot of times they'll resort to a, maybe possibly a neighborhood daycare that where it's you know five kids or seven kids and the TV's on all the time mm -hmm. and it's hard for them to sort of then 
provide better opportunities for their children because I don't think we're doing a great job as a society to help to um, support families that really need it. <laughs> okay, Heather, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I wanted to respond to the sort of laissez-faire kind of question. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, had to, I had to goad you guys somehow. No, yeah, Dimitri ahead. comes in hot if you guys haven't. <laughs> Which is why he's, go a great, or go home. he's a great moderator for panels because it really gets the conversation going. Um, and we can all have fun with each other. So um, I think one of the things I've learned from thanks to meetings like this one and serving on the board with uh, folks, some folks who are here in the room and at the table, um, is kind of the, the interdisciplinarity of this work. Uh, but we're often in our silos at our own professional conferences and we rarely come together. One thing I've learned since kind of the 2015 first conference here and, and the time since it's kind of the language barrier we tend to adopt. And I have learned over these years, like when I say something like, it depends, a lot of people at this meeting here, it doesn't matter, or we don't know, or whatever you want. And it's, it's sort of kind of this fundamental language barrier challenge that I think we have, that where meetings like this are so important to help us identify those language barriers and kind of understand the lens we all come from. And the reason that I don't like saying, no more than an hour a day for screens or something like that is because I care a lot about the mechanisms of influence. Some of the best evidence seems to be if there's a mechanism of influence. Reduced sleep uh, could be one of them if screen time's bullying out sleep. Reducing parent-child interactions or quality social interactions. And saying you can't have screens is not guaranteeing any of those things are happening. And that's why I say things like, are they getting the recommended amount of sleep? Are they getting undistracted, solid social interactions with caregivers or others? Are they getting time outside? Because that ultimately is what is predicting child outcomes. And screen time might bully out those other activities or distract from or disrupt those other activities. But getting rid of the screens isn't solving the underlying issue, which is they're not getting all of this stuff. And so that's why I answer questions like that in that way, because I, it's important to me when I talk to parents and teachers and pediatricians and others, that you know what kids need, not just what they don't need, but like what do they need? And let's help parents give them those things, not just take away the thing we don't want them to have. So it's not, so it's dodgy in the sense that I'm not literally giving you a number, but I'm trying to say, let's focus on what they most need and if they're getting all of that we will by definition reduce screen time because they have to fit in all of those other things does that make sense it, it does make sense I mean I, I think you know for myself I think of what I call the sort of direct pathway and the indirect pathway that that might mediate the relationship between media and child health outcomes and the indirect pathway is what you're talking about which is fundamentally mediated through displacement there's only so much time in a day so if you're watching a, a, if you're playing on an iPad you are not doing or potentially not doing something else that you would do, be doing that's beneficial. But I also think that there are the direct effects, which are, in my mind, directly mediated by the physical act of viewing, the content, the stimulation, the whatever it is. And so those remain even if, even if you, those remain for every hour or minute that you actually watch. And they may not exist, you're right, because part of the residual confounding we have is that we, we've not done the studies that would allow us to disentangle those two. Okay, um, let's open it up for questions. And if you don't have questions, then I have more questions for our panelists. So, but I wanna make sure we have time for your questions. So if you have a question, please go to the microphone, identify yourself, and ask your question. And we'll start over here. Hey, I'm Jennifer Joy Madden from DurableHuman.com. I'm a um, digital wellness writer and educator. And I just, before I ask my question, uh, Dr. Dimitri, um, so uh, playpens aren't that, popular anymore, they're hardly even sold, but there's something called the Yes Space, which is uh, using a baby gate to create a space for kids to get around, put uh, soft blankets and then soft toys in there, and it's kind of, a, it's another way where kids can learn how to self-regulate and play with toys, and that emulates kind of all the good things about the small. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to um, pull out the, what we were talking about, the unprecedented use of instant, infants of uh, tablets and phones on their own, so solo use. And the fact that during COVID, some families had to turn to, to tablets to babysit their children for long periods of time. Um, I've seen reports of up to 10 hours a day. And this is a really important message uh, for parents 
I'm just asking, do you think that parents need to know more about that sort of extended use of devices that has never happened before and is associated with um, behavioral delays. In fact, your journal, I think last month, had s sort of a dose response study about the more screen time, the more de developmental delays there were uh, at age two and four. Yeah, before I throw it to the panel, I'll say we did a study pre-iPad, so this was in 1990 three or four, I'm trying to remember, where we had parents keep time diaries on what their children do during a day. These were 18 to 24 month old kids. And, um, and what we found in that was that the typical toddler at that age will spend 20 minutes a day in total with their favorite toy, whether it's books or blocks or uh, uh, reading, I mean, a truck, whatever, a doll, 20 minutes a day. There weren't necessarily even 20 contiguous minutes. This was over a 24-hour period. Of course, they're only awake for about eight of those hours. But, but um, we know they'll, we didn't, they weren't iPads then. I wish they were. But they will spend much more time with iPads. So I think, to me, that alone says that this is not just an electronic toy. It's a fundamentally different experience for children because for better or worse, and let's just say that there might be upsides to it, so I have some level of equipoise, it, it garners their attention in a way that nothing else uh, does. And I think, you know, before there were toys, kids played with rocks and sticks and whatever, whatever our ancestors did, but, but presumably only for about 20 minutes. Okay, who wants to answer the question? First come, first serve. Karen. In, in terms of the long-term media use, I'm particularly concerned about how it is affecting early attention mechanisms and um, sensory mechanisms. We had a poster on sensory outcomes related to screen time, and we found that at 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months, that higher screen use predicted greater atypical sensory processing. So that would be a, a big concern about those long hours of viewing. And then um, particularly in terms of how the, the brain is processing the sensory and if, if the sens sensory um, connectivity is sort of forcing out the social connectivity. Yeah, and I wanted to follow up on, on a comment that you made about um, that the part of the thing is that really came to light during COVID was the lack of support for families. Um, and then even families that were really well resourced screen time increased, and this was right across the globe. So if you place additional stress on a family, then the response globally, at least during COVID, was this increase in screen time. And so I really think that we need to figure out also not just the screen time piece, but what were, imagine the stress that must have been on that family if that child is, is watching 10 hours and there is no other support for that family, no one else that they could turn to no other childcare options, no. So, I mean, I think we also need to consider the stress that that family is under. And we know that stress directly has uh, an impact on families, as uh, on child development as well. So it may be the screen that has um, impacts on cause and effect and processing and, um, and, and visual attention, um, and the stress that is also within that family um, that was resulting in that screen time. So. The screen time may also be a product of um, what's happening, happening in that family. So the thing I wanted to say before was if we're thinking about supporting families, we need to think about things like paid leave because paid leave will reduce family uh, stress. It will increase the amount of time that parents and children can uh, spend time with one another at that very critical uh, window, allowing them to build more of a relationship and then um, I would imagine that the consequence of that, although we'd have to test it, and we could test it, is lo probably lower screen time in that family due to the reduced stress within that family. So I don't want us just to think of this the effect of the screen time, although I do think that there are probably unique effects of screen time as we've been talking about, but also the effects of the family um, under stress that had to, had to have the, the only opportunity that they had for their child or strategy that they had for their child was that 10 hours of screen time. And the second thing I wanted to say is that your group is digital well-being. Is that... Oh, your? my group? No. I'm, my uh, website is durablehuman.com. Durable human. But you mentioned digital well-being? Uh, just as being a digital well-being educator. 
So I think that's a really, I would love to start using that term rather than screen time um, because digital well-being within the family is, is a really critical, I mean, you know, because you're, this is your profession, but we don't often think about the well-being, um, so it's serving different purposes, but how can we have, um, how can we coexist with all this digitization, yeah. and yeah. how can we sort of help support parents to think through and mindfully use their own media and their media with their children? And so, I don't know what's going to happen with that child who had 10 hours, but I think there are a lot of structural things or a lot of things around us learning about digital well-being rather than just screen time. Uh, we're going to move on because we have a lot of other questions. Um, we're not done. I, I'm sorry. We, I want to give other people a chance. I'm gonna I'll say one, straight. and I'm going to make sure you keep your answers briefer, all of you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Great. Uh, I will say that some of the most interesting work that's come out of the pandemic that I've seen around developmental outcomes in kids is that if you look now at the best done studies, the best control studies, it turns out that the youngest kids actually not only did not fare worse, they actually did better. And it's the older kids who did worse. And I think it's because those young infants were actually at home with a, with a parent who may have had some kind of paid leave because she was working remotely, but I don't know. It's a fascinating study that we published in GMO Pediatrics. Yes, you're yeah. up. Thank you. So I'm Jen Iman from Dartmouth College, and Karen, this comment goes to you. So I was really excited to hear about your randomized trial, reducing screen time among kids uh, with exhibiting autistic syndrome symptoms. But then Dimitri made a comment which made me like question. So I was hoping you could clarify. Do you do you truly think that? high levels of screen time could causally be related to autism disorder or that it's perhaps exacerbating underlying conditions that exist and then reducing improves those. So thank you very much for that question because I did want to address the causation because I want to, we, we have not shown any studies that show causation. Um, we simply report on the findings that we have. Um, so in terms of, um, and we had a poster on the um, association between screen time and autism-like symptoms, and there was 24 studies. 10 of them showed an association between screen time and uh, an autism diagnosis. One, um, eight showed an association between screen time and autism-like symptoms, and then the association between screen time and autism severity in children with autism and um, earlier screen time and autism um, diagnosis. But I want to be clear that what we're talking about is not traditional autism. It's, um, it's a very different but manifests, manifests similarly. So there was a case report that um, was out of uh, Ganji uh, Ozanoff's group, uh, uh, UC Davis, in 2023, and they showed a 24-month-old who had a, di a diagnosis of autism. They were in an NIH study, and then they were supposed to come back in four months to go uh, undergo intervention, and that child at four months had absolutely no autism symptoms. So they went back and reviewed the video, and, and 25 autism specialists review, reviewed the, the initial autism assessment video. They all said 100% that child had autism, and then the uh, video uh, that was four months later 80% said 100% that child does not have autism. So, so what we're sh seeing is a, a masquerade syndrome. So these children who have the high exposure uh, and are showing the autism symptoms, they, they will usually get an autism diagnosis, but it doesn't mean that they have traditional autism. So are there risk factors? Like, likely the brain is more um, oriented to the audiovisual processing and then the screen, they may be more drawn to screens and then the screen time may exacerbate it. So I just wanted to be clear on that. Understood, and I, when I said you believe, I, th I think I, if, if I misspoke, I think you personally believe, not that you've shown it, but that you believe there's, uh, um, and we don't need to get into that now, unless you feel it, but, but the, the, the reason I brought the HBCD study is because if it's not experimental, it will never, cut that Gordian knot. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Mary Bruce. I'm from Telethon Kids Institute and thank you all so much for your time. This panel has been really, really interesting hearing all your insights. Um, my question was actually very closely related to that one, just around um, neurodiversity and how we think about that. Um, but I'm going to reframe so we don't have to um, touch on that again. To think more broadly about screen time in early childhood, I think as researchers, we're really focused on trying to provide the best evidence possible. And as some of you have touched on uh, in early childhood anyway, it's not necessarily clear what causation is or what is the best type of screen time for different ages. And yet we publish studies that say things like increased screen time um, is associated with autism-like symptoms or ADHD symptoms or these delays. And I just, I don't know, I wanted to get your thoughts on this leads to a lot of moral panic and what kind of responsibility do we have as researchers, if anything, if any responsibility, to, I guess, think about what that might mean for parents dealing with these things on like a day-to-day -day basis, um, struggling in their home with their child's screen time and lots of other things in their life. Um, is there any responsibility that we have on us to, I don't know, just think about how we frame these things and, and what questions we're asking in terms of screen time? Anyone want to answer that? I think I can speak to that for sure, because when we published it in JAMA Pediatrics a few years ago, that was the MRI evidence linking more screen time with lower levels of myelination in different parts of the brain related to reading and literacy skills and lower skills as well. I got about 80 calls from, from media outlets in like the first two days, and, and so many of the reporters wanted to say, so you're saying that screen time is toxic for kids' brains, right? And, and they really want to know that like it's, it's like a, a radiation effect and it's melting <laughs> their, their neurons away, and it, but then it, it, anyway, and, and so I really had to sort of back up from it and say, well, what it really means is what it means is that we found this correlation, it, and to me it means we should be careful, we should do more studies, and, and again, I, I do tend to err on the side of caution. I'd, I'd rather less screen time in, until we know it's safe than go ahead and do it and then find out it's not safe. Um, but in any case, um, I've also found that like it tends to split people. Like if you come out making stronger comments like screen time is really harmful, you'll get people that love screens that say, you know, don't listen to that guy, he's full of, you know what? And some that just sort of think you're a messiah if they don't like, if they don't like screen time. So the more extreme you get about your conclusions, the more you're gonna divide your audience, I think. And so we have to be careful to be as nuanced as we can be, I think. And can I answer that as well, quickly? Briefly. Okay. So um, I think that there are real sensitivities and it's very important to present data as the, the findings and not overstep them. But I, and I also think that it's important to though, share those findings because particularly in our work, there's a lot of children at risk that potentially could benefit from information. So children that may be genetically at risk or children that are having uh, symptoms that have a very high screen exposure that parents don't know this information and it could be life changing. So I see both sides of it, but 100% sensitivity is extremely important. Thank you. Uh, over here. Uh, this question is actually going to follow up really nicely and be a very, very short response from each of you. Um, my name is Sarah Cucker. I'm at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. And full disclosure, I do collaborate with part of the CAFE Consortium. Um, but I'm also very uh, sympathetic to this idea that physicians and researchers alike, all of us have probably had a parent ask us, what age should I give my kid media? How much should they have? And so when we're thinking about making this information digestible and easily accessible, what do we tell parents? And so I'm really curious for each of you, your two cents, well, what, what advice do you give parents? <laughs> What's your elevator pitch when you have someone, especially a parent, right. asking you that appreciates the nuances at the same time as not scaring them and saying, oh, I'm a bad parent now because I gave them a minute of TV time? I, I, I appreciate your question. That's why I actually asked it at the very beginning because I figured people would ask it at the end. And I think part of what you're alluding to is the difference between somebody who's in the position to be giving professional advice. I mean, those of us that are clinicians are asked that exact question and telling a parent it depends <laughs> leaves them dissatisfied. I think that strategies that Heather and Rachel were outlining would work, um, but it's... Well, that's why I'm curious to, to see across all, all of you uh, if a parent approaches you right now. Because as a researcher, I get approached this all the time. And as, as someone who has expertise in child development, I am in some ways qualified to say this is what's important. 
I, th um. I think the advice is, I think the confusion that we haven't even talked about and that has been a big thing um, is content, right? So the biggest thing, one of the biggest challenges that we haven't talked about is how do children, uh, parents sort of navigate through this morass of, of, of media that is not always high quality. And so what I think is important is to think about if you're going to choose media, how do you choose media? And I would say, uh, and, and have said, that it, you should think about things that could be socially relevant and meaningful to your child so that exist in their real world and that you can talk about with them uh, and engage with them both in the digital world and the real world. The other thing is following up on what Heather said about the media plan, right? So the media plan is really helpful to help parents sort of navigate through their day and think about how they're dividing up their day um, rather than just thinking about a screen time limit because you will always go to your limit. Um, but on a rainy day, and you might need, you know, you might think it'd be great to watch a, an old movie with your child and watch ET or something. Um, and on a sunny day, there's no time for that, right? Because you're outside doing something or you're busy or you have to go to school or there's lots of other things that are demands on your time. So I think the media plan is also a really helpful one and there's a really nice tool on the AAP site. Thank you. Last question, because only because you've been standing for so long, I don't want, it doesn't <laughs> seem fair. Thank you. My name is Allison Snyder. I'm at the University of California, Davis. I'm a third year PhD student. My question, I, I want to broaden the conversation a bit. So, you know, we're talking about screen time and, and the reason this matters is because as Dr. Barr and Dr. Hutton have alluded to, there's a lot of plasticity in the brain at early ages. They're learning so much. And screen time is really leisure time. Um, and to historically contextualize this, you know, we've panicked over everything starting from literary novels, being concerned that you know, this is gonna take away from our workday, this is gonna take away from our productivity, we can think about radio, and I won't go on to save time. But, you know, we're making these recommendations about screen time, and I have a feeling with my question, I know what Dr. Barr and Dr. Kerkorian will say, but is there any leisure time for children? If yes, how much um, in a day? Is it okay if there are times of the day where they're actually not learning anything and just sort of being leisurely? Uh, like adults. I, I think ironically, um, one, of the th one of the drivers of, of screen use is it shows up, especially in babies, and this is an earlier point about infants, is the parents are given this idea that it's educational. And so they're, they're watching lots of videos and they're watching, you know, you look at all the apps and everything on, on the um, Apple, the iTunes store or whatever, and they all say educational for kids. Like the kids are supposed to be learning all the time whatever they're watching. So we've almost, blurred that line between learning and not learning leisure. I mean, I would much rather a child watch uh, Frozen than watch, you know, two hours of YouTube videos that are about a bunch of different random things. And, and final thing, quick to the point about infants, is I think it really is important to reassure parents at that age that they are their child's best teacher in that way, that, that their role hasn't been outsourced because there's all kinds of media and products that are supposed to teach their kids stuff. Because a lot of parents do get sort of um, you know, feel disempowered, like, well, my child likes their iPad better than they like reading with me, for example. And just really encouraging them to, that, that their child wants to spend time with them, they're going to really benefit from them is really important. Anyway, and that could be leisure time, leisure time too. I, I, I don't think there's any leisure time in infancy, which is not the way you think of it as adults. I think children are always learning. Um, every, every experience they have is a, is a teachable moment for them. So. It, it, I don't know that the, the conceptual model you're using, at least from my standpoint, applies to early children. Can there I isn't a time where they're doing, you could argue that no one's ever doing nothing, but for infants, everything they're doing is affecting their neurocognitive and social development. Including Every media minute. or excluding media? It's, media is definitely affecting it, okay. either by d indirect or the, my, my opinion, and I'm not gonna let the rest of the panel answer because of enough time. <laughs> my opinion is that either through the indirect or direct pathway alluded to before, yes it is. Thank you all very, very much. I had it, I was gonna ask more questions, but we ran out of time.